July is Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Mental illness affects millions of people across the United States, regardless of race, sexuality, or upbringing, impacting every aspect of their lives. Our next guest knows this all too well. Larry Johnson was a star running back for the Miami Dolphins, but run-ins with the law and domestic violence issues ended his storied career. As he tried to deal with anger issues, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. But unlike Johnson, many people never get help. In fact, a whopping 80% of African Americans and Hispanics suffering from some sort of mental health condition receive no treatment at all. When it comes to Asian Americans, only one third dealing with the mental illness receive treatment. Here to share more is former Miami Dolphins running back Larry Johnson, now working with the nonprofit The Motivational Edge as chairman of Edge Ambassadors, and Carlos LaRouri, who sits on the board of directors for the National Alliance on Mental Illness in Miami Day. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. La Rauri, That's correct? Right. Yes, right. I've been practicing that. Thank you both for being here. Pleasure. So, Larry, let's dive in with you. Uh, your past is no mystery. It's no surprise. It's been tumultuous. Um, you had a storied career as a football player and had a lot of issues when it came to domestic violence, violence against girlfriends. You've been on probation. Um, take us through that difficult time. At what point in your life, as all of this was unfolding, did you say to yourself, this has to stop, or I need help? Take us through that time. I think I got, when I got deep into my career, when I was starting getting a little bit more successful, I was able to hold those demons at bay. I was able to go home and not be to worry about anything. What I suffered from was to be able to check my emotions and not bring them home with me. And what happened was more and more, I, like going through my career, I was getting difficult. Practices weren't going well. Games weren't going well. The personnel wasn't going well. So I would take all those problems home with me. And when I didn't have anybody or anybody to reach out to to talk to, I would drink, I would go out. So everything that happened to me would be a result of a day's worth or a week's worth of frustration. And it will come out on whoever was with me by the end of the night. And it always happened to be my girlfriends or, or anybody who was a friend of me was gonna have to deal with my anger and my issues based on me not being able to contain myself long enough to find a healthier outlet to deal with the struggles of going through an NFL career and, and coming to the end of that NFL career and obviously having you know my first child. All, a lot of that's changed only because of my, my first child. Like it was, it was awakening when she could understand what I would say. She would understand what I would do. She would know when I would leave and not come back. She would understand those things. And that's when I really, really changed for me was the fact that I now have to be responsible for another human being. And I have to set an example that's not, that's much not like the one that I came out of, which is, you know, playing football and being the, the, the rowdiest guy and being the guy that's always mad on the football field and being able to take care of a beautiful little girl, you obviously have to have a different uh, mental approach to it. And at one point you were diagnosed with bipolar disorder, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did that help you explain to yourself a lot of your behavior and what it stemmed from? I had to literally, when I was done with football, I went through a real depression spiral and that's where it came from was the fact that what am I going to do now? Where am I going to put all this energy at? Where am I going to put everything that's who I am? Where do I put it at now? I can't just put it on the football field because that's what my excuse was. Mm -hmm. I think once I took years off from, from football and gone and see therapists, gone to see psych psych you know, psychiatrists, mm -hmm. and even the league tried to help me out by putting me into a program. And I think looking back and looking into myself deeply, I had to understand there was something really, really wrong with how I choose to use anger to, to get over things. And that's what I was doing. I was using anger and fear and self-defense mechanism, toxic vices to, to make an excuse of why I am the way I am and kind of laughed about it and like, oh, I played a bad boy role and be fun doing it. And when I kept getting arrested, I had to look at, look, I'm going to miss the best years of my daughter's life being locked up every single time that I used alcohol or, or the clubs or, or nightlife to, to cope with what I was dealing with. 
So let's, before we talk about the motivational edge, which is what you're involved in now, and I think you're putting a lot of your energy into doing something positive, Carlos, let's talk about the work that you do at NAMI and how important it is right now to highlight that there are minorities out there who are suffering from mental illness who aren't getting the help that they need. Uh, unfortunately, that's right. Um, I'm with NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We're the largest grassroots advocacy organization that helps build better lives for individuals with mental health issues and their families. And we know that mental illnesses are very common. They affect one out of five Americans. 50% uh, of them present before the age of 14. Yet we also know that African Americans and Hispanics like myself often uh, receive care at less than half the rate of whites. So there's a huge discrepancy between um, these mental health issues, how prevalent they are, and, and people seeking care and services for them. Why do you think minorities aren't getting the help that they need? Is it cultural? And Larry, you might even be able to speak to this as well. Is it one of those things that people just don't want to talk about or there just aren't services in their community? What is it? Sure, it's realistically speaking a combination of both. Um, on the cultural side of it, I mean, look, it's very hard to, to face having a mental health issue, and we often have misconceptions and, and misunderstanding. Is it drug use? Is it poor parenting? All that is scientifically untrue. So there are, there are cultural barriers, and there's also systemic barriers. There's a system that discriminates against individuals with mental health issues, and they often get stuck in the system, stuck in, in emergency rooms and stuck in jails. So we have cultural issues, and we need people to be open about it and talk about these mental health issues. And then we also need to fix a broken mental health system. So when people want to seek care, they can easily access it. And I think part of what you're doing here is the awareness to let people know we're here and you can seek us out if you feel that you need that extra help, correct? That's right. I mean, yeah. you know, hey, it's okay, man. Uh, mental <laughs> health issues are, are quite common. They, they happen. And it's okay to, to, to seek help. And I, I have to commend my, my friend Larry for the courage that it takes to, to say, you know, hey, man, you know, I need help. And, yeah. and, and life goes on. Let's talk about Motivational Edge. Tell us all about it and how that's helping youth in our community. Uh, we serve over uh, 2,500 youth. We partnered up with um, a lot of foster homes, AMI, our kids, Citrus, our foster home kids, and we get a lot of kids in juvenile detention centers. We also provide services there. And what we actually are trying to get them to understand is that it's okay to be a child. It's okay to be a kid. I think in the society, we're choking our youth to make them adults quicker than they need to be adults. And most of that, that's how mental illness comes about. And these kids just don't have the... the the services that actually help them get through those troubled times. You know, most of them come from, you know, broken homes. So a lot of that starts at home, but then when we get them, we are allowing, allow them to be themselves. We allow them to, to paint, to draw. A lot of them do poetry. A lot of kids are whiz at, you know, working the circuit board for studios and stuff yeah. like that. So they're, they're always involved in arts, and we just try to cater to them as to keep them, you know, you know preoccupied and keep them with, you know, healthy, healthy things to get, you know, get done. And give them that vehicle to do that. Mm -hmm. We have a testimonial right now from somebody who's involved with Motivational Edge. Let's take a listen. When I think the Motivational Edge is, to me, it's more than just a lyrical expression center. It's a place where I can go to feel safe and other kids can go to feel safe and can also express themselves musically. It's more than music, but academically, because since I've joined the Edge, I've got better in my reading classes. I hope that I can be the one that gets the Berkeley College Scholarship. And to go from there, I hope I become a bigger and better artist. So one of the things that you heard her say was talking about being safe. Mm -hmm. So speak to that for a minute. Do these students want to feel that they have a safe place to go and express themselves? Yeah, I think it's, most of the kids, well, mostly the young boys, are, mm -hmm. you know, you have to get them going. But yeah. it's so fun when you get them all in a room and they're all allowed to be vulnerable. And I think that's the one thing they're missing. They don't have the chance to be vulnerable in their classrooms or at home. We give them opportunity to be vulnerable. We give them opportunities to, to let them be themselves and to grow as much as they want to grow. As, new, as long as you have a child that wants to do that, mm. they'll, it's contagious. It's, they'll, the next guy wants to do it, the next girl wants to do it, the next boy wants to come in and, and perform too. So it's, it, it gives that camaraderie of having kids who want to have a healthier you know, outlet of doing something together that they actually love doing. Yeah, tell us about the ambassadors, because you're chief ambassador, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're the chief. I'm, I'm, I'm more of the money guy, the, the oh, money girl getter okay. guy. So basically what I do is I make sure that anybody who you know, d donates money or donates to the program, they obviously see what the, what the kids are bringing to the program and able to put their name on anything they want to do. Like if we open up a, 
uh, a studio, we were allowed to, through donations, to put that business name as a okay. representative, and you get to be and feel the control of having kids coming in and actually having a nice outlet. So it's nice to have, you know, different, you know, collaborations from sure. different businesses to be able to be able to do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you so much for being here. No and no congratulations problem. on all the hard work that you're doing. And you as well, Carlos at NAMI, it's helping a lot of people. So thanks thank so you. much. And for more information on mental health and local services, visit NAMIofMiami.org. And if you'd like to become an EDGE ambassador or want more information on their programs, visit TheMotivationalEdge.com. As always, you can find these links on our Facebook page at YourselfFL.